Hi, I'm Laura Greiner. I'm your host today for the Swine It podcast. And today with me, I have Pedro Urola from the University of Minnesota. Pedro, how are you today? Doing well. Thank you, Laura. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Well, spring is about on us now, so hopefully it's a little bit warmer in Minnesota. <laughs> well, um, for our audience who doesn't know Pedro, um, Dr. Pedro Urola is um, a research associate professor at the University of Minnesota in both the Department of Animal Science and the College of Veterinary Medicine. And Pedro, would you mind giving our, our audience a little bit more background about yourself and, and how you came to where you're at today? Great. Um, very glad to see you, Laura, and, and be here uh, with the Swine Eat podcast. Um, I am originally from Venezuela. I study uh, what would be the equivalent of veterinary medicine in Venezuela. And um, my wife actually was coming to Minnesota during her internship to work with a professor called Carlos Pijuan in the College of Veterinary Medicine. And um, Maria came to Minnesota. She started to uh, work later in her PhD work with, with Dr. Pijuan. And then I came to Minnesota and did my master's degree here. So I, I kind of follow Maria to come to Minnesota. That's how I ended in Minnesota. After a while then, I went to the University of Illinois actually. Uh, while doing my master's here at the University of Minnesota, I met Dr. Hans Stein in, when he was still in South Dakota. I actually spent a summer working with him uh, in Brookings, South Dakota. There he invited me to come and, and work on my PhD at the University of Illinois. So I joined him uh, in 2007 uh, for, the PhD, for my PhD work in, at the University of Illinois. And at that time, then Maria finished her PhD, came to, she came to Illinois and worked at, at the University of Illinois. And then uh, at that time, we had uh, bought a house, uh, uh, a townhome here in Minnesota while we were students. And we thought, well, we we're going to do all this money uh, instead of renting, we are going to uh, buy our own house. Well, that was in right when the pricing of the houses were high, we bought at a high price and everything came down at low pricing. Therefore, we came to, uh, I was offered a job at Cargill Animal Nutrition and Maria and I were, this is the perfect job. We have a house that we still need to pay in Minnesota. Well, let's go back to Minnesota. Uh, so then I came to work uh, uh, with Cargill Animal Nutrition. Later, Cargill purchased Provimi and another company. And part of uh, uh, the arrangement was that I go to work with the AKI at the time uh, section of Cargill in, in Ohio. And my, relate, my, my story was with my wife and I moved and stayed apart due to our career several times. And that was the time that we said, this is the last time we're not going to move and be apart. She was already starting her career here at the University of Minnesota. So therefore, uh, we, we decided, I decided to stay at the University of Minnesota and started to work uh, in 2012 for the University of Minnesota. And I've been here since then. Great, great. Yes, I think I first met you when you were at University of Illinois. I think that's when we, we first met, I met you and your wife. I think even if I remember, it was at a, a lunch meeting sitting in a, in a restaurant somewhere. But um, so I've, I've known you for a long time. Um, as we were talking before the podcast, the, the thing I know about, about Pedro or when I, I think about topics, I think about Pedro and, and fiber and understanding alternative ingredients. Um, you've had a lot of uh, different books or chapters that you've written as well as some reviews over the course of a few years that I've enjoyed reading. And I think that's a really good topic for our audience today, particularly when we look at where we're at in terms of ingredient prices today and feed costs. So um, I think, Pedro, let's, let's just kind of start down that process of talking about alternative ingredients. And so um, when we think about alternative ingredients, we, we think about digestibility and, and energy and, right, distillers and wheat mids and some of those, well, if I put those in, maybe I have to add more fat in to, to get similar performance. 
And so can you kind of help our audience uh, understand a little bit more about digestibility and energy in relationship to alternative ingredients? Great, Laura. Um, yes, uh, I think it's a very interesting topic, uh, very timely, and, and one that has been uh, a long part of my career. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, my master's was in determining the uh, digestibility of amino acids in distilled dry grains with solubles, and later uh, with a PhD with fiber digestibility in corn byproducts too. And in, in these years of research, one thing that I learned is, for example, distillers is not distillers. There are very different, uh, there is variation within distillers grains. With middlings, there is variation in nutrient composition. There is variation in their digestibility of the feed ingredient too. And therefore, um, how the animal utilizes that feed ingredients varies greatly from one uh, source of the product to another source of the product. And I think I've listened uh, uh, in the podcast before uh, one of the interview uh, to Wayne Cast. Uh, Wayne, I think one of his key points was loadings, 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 or the numbers that you have in your nutritional system makes a lot of what you can do. And, and I think those numbers better be accurate. Well, I think that's important, right? And, and when we talk about alternative feed ingredients, it becomes even uh, more important. Um, therefore, yes, if, if we want to use distillers grains, yeah, you better know what energy values you are going to use uh, for uh, distillers grains. So we've done quite a bit of work on developing uh, prediction equations. So you can use as an input, for example, the concentration of protein, the concentration of ether extract or, or the lipid portion, and, and then calculate what will be the metabolizable energy of, of the distillers grains that uh, somebody's purchasing. Uh, there are many of these type of equations that have been developed over the years. Uh, the NRC certainly has uh, uh, some, um, but those were developed for different type of feed ingredients and in different contexts, because a lot of these equations were developed empirically. So we fed an animal, measured the metabolizable energy or the net energy, and then came back and did a bunch of regressions to see how the protein, the fat, the carbohydrates all were contributing to the energy that we already measured. There are other systems that are more uh, mechanistic that they said, well, we need to think of how much energy comes from a unit of digestible protein, how much energy comes from a unit of digestible uh, um, uh, fat or, or fatty acids and from the carbohydrates and the carbohydrates from the starch, from the sugars and the components of them. And those um, mechanistic equations uh, are, are quite helpful, I think, because then they, um, they uh, allowed you to assess the nutritional value or the energy value of the alternative feed ingredient without needing to be doing tests every single time. And so uh, allows for flexibility into this, into the nutritional system. Mm -hmm. And for example, if we were um, to evaluate what ingredients do I want to use? For example, now that we see high prices of corn and soy, uh, well, the first question is, okay, I'm going to select a different feed ingredient or, or try to use alternative or study the contribution of those alternatives to my system. Well, you better have an, uh, a study, a system on how you're going to assign the net energy value, for example, to that feed ingredient. I think that's quite important. Um, and so therefore it's something that we've done quite a bit of work uh, in, in our group. How about when you think about alternative ingredients, um, 
you know, when we think about different phases of production, you know, are all alternative ingredients, quote, viewed equally in terms of ME from a grow finished pig versus a sow? You know, should we be using different equations for, you know, the different phases of production for those ingredients? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. And if we look at the uh, net energy system from France, from Indra, for example, uh, they already assign a different uh, energy value to a feed ingredient that is fed to a growing pig than the feed ingredient being fed to a sow. The, the other interesting point though, is when we build uh, an equation or an uh, energy evaluation system that is based on the mechanisms that I've mentioned before, the actual input to the energy system is the amount of digestible protein, digestible fat, digestible fiber. So you may not need a different equation because the coefficient of digestibility will be different for the growing pig than is for the sow. So in this case, what you need to come up with is not the NE value for the growing pig versus the sow. What you need to investigate or, or work is the digestibility coefficients that you were going to use in the equation to calculate energy that is different for the growing pig than is for the sow. So, so yeah, that's on, on you know, the evaluation on the ingredient itself, right? We, we want to um, look at the ingredient is used uh, as the digestibility of the components of the diet is different between the uh, young pig or the growing pig uh, to the sow. And then depending on what system you're using, you can look at into, do I have to investigate the coefficient for digestibility or do I need to learn more about the, or the net energy value that comes assigned to that feed ingredient. But the other portion, I think that is also interesting to, to look when evaluating changes to the feeding program is that the energy that the animal uh, um, has available is partitioned for different functions between lean growth rate and fat deposition, for example. And that efficiency of utilizing the energy for protein deposition is different than using that energy for lipid deposition. And it, very, it changes as the pig gets older. So the NRC has some modifications to the energy uh, uh, partition as the animal uh, progresses. Um, and and um, they, they call that effective energy. Um, so once we assign the energy value to the feed ingredient, nowadays we assign just one number. But in fact, that number should be being a little bit different or what the animal is going to um, uh, deposit as a lipids or as a, a lean growth will be a little bit different depending on what stage we are feeding the animal. Therefore, it's something that um, uh, needs to be taken into consideration when we are evaluating the, the energy system or the alternative feed ingredients. And I remember what very nice talk from Paul Klein at Christensen Farms. He talked at Midwest meetings, perhaps three or four years ago, um, where he's, we, he was talking in the Gary Lee symposium that you need to have a system in place where you can evaluate the feed ingredient and the response of the animals in your system to the amount of energy that you are supplying. And, and having that work out ahead of time will be serve of benefit. Then when times like this come today, that you will start making decisions, how do I feed those animals? Well, uh, based on the changing ingredient price, then uh, you have that, had that system in place. Yeah, I think that's a very good point because sometimes you don't have that luxury, right? There's There might be an ingredient that Right for let's let's go back a year when distillers wasn't available. If we were in that same situation right now, 
with higher feed prices, we'd be searching for a lot of maybe different alternative ingredients that we hadn't evaluated within our systems. And so where do you start that process of, of finding digestibility coefficients and, and maybe something that you haven't explored before, but, but now in certain situations you might be asked to do so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think that nowadays uh, a lot of rapid methods that can be utilized or because we may not have the time to then now go and put pigs in metabolism cages and collect feces and so on. By the time we do those analysis, the price of the ingredient already changed. So a way to speed up the process, um, depending on what we are analyzing, for example, um, in vitro digestibility procedures with pepsin pancreatin has been applied by uh, uh, feed companies um, to evaluate, okay, the differences in digestibility of nutrients or even dry matter to, to make it simple across different feed ingredients or sources of the same feed ingredient as a way to gain then knowledge of the coefficient of digestibility that can be utilized in the calculation of net energy. And then the second component is the digestible amino acid portion. Um, in my master work, I remember we were looking at color of distiller's grains. And if distiller's grains were dark, well, they're supposed to be of lower digestibility. And if they are brighter, they are supposed to be of higher digestibility. And to some extent, at the streams, they are true that something that you already burnt out, yes, it's going to be the digestibility of lysine or standardized illegal digestibility of lysine is going to be less than in a feed ingredient that has not been heat treated as much. But also we want precision. We want to know the middle end or uh, there are many uh, uh, differences between the extremes. So we, find out, we found out that color is okay to differentiate the extremes, but not very useful in determining the digestibility of nutrients, or, or in this case of lice in, in the, among sources of distilled strains. So it's something that I did during my master. I uh, remember as I was grinding ileal digester to send that for analysis, I always brought a paper with me um, and I was reading about mylar reaction because heating the sugar with the proteins, the reaction is called mylar reaction. And, and the color comes from uh, the formation of late chemical components from that mylar reaction. So I started reading uh, uh, some papers about mylar reaction and came across um, a paper that I was, I, I can remember reading that while I was grinding um, uh, uh, the ileal digesta. Uh, that he said that depending on the phases of the mylar reaction, only until the end when something is really cooked is where you see a change in color. But in between, there are some products that have like a ring structure that produce or changes in fluorescence, even though there is no change in color quite yet. I said, oh, very interesting. Then I started to Google fluorescence and, and looking at the information and came across a professor at the University of Minnesota, Theodore Labusa is his name, who happened to have been an expert uh, in food science and nutrition in mylar reaction. And so he said, yes, we have the equipment here. Um, you can talk to my postdoc. He can show you where to flip the switch and go measure your thing and see you later. <laughs> So I started doing those measurements and, and um, quite so, yes, uh, measuring fluorescence did a very nice job at pre uh, predicting the digestibility of lysine among the sources of DDGS that we were working. So where do you start? Well, I think one starts to understand what makes the ingredient different and then analyze uh, what makes that difference. There are in vitro systems that are 
been utilized in the industry for, for years. And there may be some others that come new into, uh, into play like fluorescence. Um, we've developed some uh, equations to predict the concentration of digestible lysine among sources of DGGS simply by using the initial concentration of lysine. Uh, so you can send a sample of DDGs to, to analyze for the concentration of lysine. You take the total level of lysine and multiply by a coefficient and give you the amount of digestible lysine. The coefficient can change a little bit as the concentration of lysine increases in the feed ingredient. It's something that we did a meta-analysis to find out. Now, is it imperfect? Yes. Perhaps it's less uh, accurate than if I was even to do other more uh, refined measurements, even like reactive lysine, right? But I think it will give you a number that is sufficiently to move forward. And over time, depending on how much there is a benefit to, for example, my business, then I will evaluate, do I need to get more refined with other systems? How, how much do I want to invest resources and time to gain knowledge on uh, the amount of digestible nutrients? I think there is, and there is continued pressure for us to continue towards that path, to understand the variation among the feed ingredients and, and make sure that we have a system in place that allows to capture uh, that difference. Yeah, I think that's a, a very key point is the, the variation among the feed ingredients. And, you know, we've seen it even within same manufacturing companies that have multiple manufacturing sites, the feed ingredients can be completely different. Mycotoxin levels can be completely different, right? There's all those challenges, um, but I think you offer some really good insight as to some potential ways to start that process of evaluating some digestibilities and, and getting our, our minds around products that maybe we haven't had to use before. So I, I think that's a, a great discussion piece for our audience to think about. Um, but along those lines, you know, not everything that we get for alternative ingredients is easily digested, right? There's going to be components where we're not getting necessarily all the goodies out of, mm -hmm. out of our alternative ingredients. So what would be some steps that we can do to help improve the digestibility of, of the fiber, of the lysine, you know, anything that, that we can, of course, get more value out of that product today? Yes. Um, so I think that the first um, thing that one can study or use uh, is enzymes. So um, enzymes that could break that, that can break down the carbohydrates within the feed ingredient. Um, in my research and my personal uh, observation has been that it really depends what feed ingredient you are using. So some sources of fiber are not as um, uh, capable of being degraded by uh, some enzymes. For example, not all silanases break down Arabino silence, which are components of fiber, uh, they do not degrade Arabino silence in the same way in corn distillers grains as they do with wheat middlings. So they seem to be more effective in wheat middlings and then maybe less effective. And because the Arabino silence in corn are different than the Arabino silence in wheat. And therefore, the enzymes tend to work differently in, in each one of these uh, cases. And for the most part, we see benefit of using uh, these enzymes. But when I have analyzed the actual digestibility of the fiber, when we have used silanase enzymes, for example, or, or other carbohydrate degrading enzymes, because many of these are a mixture of so glucanases and silanases and so on, when we have analyzed these uh, enzymes, either in vitro or in animals experiments, the degree of digestibility of fiber that we observe is not very high. There's been quite small improvement in digestibility of fiber, even though 
there may be some benefits on animal performance. So therefore we have studied other means, other ways to increase the digestibility of fiber uh, in deciduous grains and other byproducts. Uh, we've used recently something called ammonia fiber expansion. And ammonia fiber expansion uses alkaline conditions uh, produced by ammonia, the addition of ammonia and high temperature about 100 degrees Celsius and uh, high pressure. And the idea is to break down the fiber components uh, using these um, uh, high pressure and high temperature under alkaline conditions. And in that case, we have observed that yes, you get quite a bit increase in uh, energy uh, digestibilities to the point that we've seen um, uh, more than 500 kcals uh, in, in among sources of DDGs in, in the uh, increase in digestibility. But it's a system that nowadays is not something that somebody can run and find somebody that can do a service for you or an ethanol plant that right now is going to install that next day. So I've been also working with uh, colleagues in bioproducts and biosystems engineering in taking wet distillers grains. So uh, during process of distillers production, there is a process where, or a, a portion of the process where the distillers is wet. And in that case is favorable to use fungi because fungi can use the moisture. So, and, uh, and during the process of growth. So these uh, engineers have been looking at different strains of fungi um, that can grow, for example, in distillers grains. And now we have observed that even adding other feed ingredients, mixing with the fungi seem to improve the growth of the fungi and the breakdown of the fiber in the feeding in the in the wet distillers. For example, we were adding feather meal, which is also a byproduct of low digestibility of proteins in feather meal tends to be low. And we are now mixing two seemingly low quality feed ingredients uh, and um, into this fermentation process. And now the fungal biomass has a higher nutritional value than the other feed ingredients that we were mixing because fungi biomass has a high level, for example, of the amino acid tryptophan. And, and, and the digestibility of those amino acids is actually greater than the digestibility of the same amino acids in the let's call it parent products or the ingredients that we were using to make the, the mixture to begin with. So I think it is an interesting concept um, of fermenting or processing the feed ingredients to uh, gain a new value of that feed ingredient. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting technique. I had not heard of, of you doing that. So. That's certainly something to look forward to down down the road. Um, you know, when I was listening to your xylanase, and I've I've heard you give a few different talks on fiber and how not all fiber is fiber and and so forth. What kind of recommendation would you make to people today? Um, in that, you know, I've seen enzyme packs where we throw in xylanase from a couple of different companies, and we just call it an enzyme pack, and we we hope for the best. Um, so that we can get some flexibility if we change from wheat mids tomorrow to distillers the next day? Or you know, do you believe we should be more targeted in what we're putting into the, the diets as far as enzymes go? You know, I don't know, know exactly, you know, make this mixture of this enzyme with those other mixture. The, the only recommendation that I will say is whatever you do, make sure you can measure what the outcome you're expecting from, from that change, which, maybe comes back to Paul Klein's talk at Midwest meetings is you have to have a system. And then once you make changes, you want to be able to measure the outcome of that change. Um, so yes, I, I think that um, 
not all enzymes are made equal. And actually combinations of enzyme and the synchrony of how those enzymes work may matter too, because one can break down the fiber into let's say oligosaccharides that are later broken down by another enzyme. So the combinations of enzymes do matter. Uh, and it's something that uh, I think needs to be uh, studied more, more carefully. And being able to measure that within your production system or uh, within my production system so that I make sure that I obtain what I, what I need to. Very good. I think that's great, great advice for our audience. One thing I've heard throughout this conversation is, as we've talked about, using the animal, of course, to tell us the response. And, um, and you've obviously had a lot of work also doing cannulations and digestibility work, but can you allude a little bit more to how we would use systems biology um, to help us understand the response to these different nutrient requirements or needs? That's great, Laura. Yes, um, you know, a lot of the animal's response, we can, uh, let's say, we can predict based on the level of energy that we put into the diet. Yes, if we uh, decrease the level of energy on the diet, we would expect feed intake of the animal to increase uh, to compensate for, for uh, energy intake. So energy concentration of amino acids or phosphorus can help us to explain part of the response of the animal to the diet. But there are many other cases where the response of the animal to the diet, we don't know, or we cannot predict only based on energy, amino acids, and, and uh, phosphorus. So um, assistance biology is a good technique. Um, these are, for example, uh, metabolomics. So when we analyze uh, small chemical components in tissues or samples from animals, but also something called chemometrics, which is measuring those chemical components in the diet or uh, uh, of the animal. And using, for example, the systems biology tool metabolomics, we did some collaboration with a group in Norway uh, where they are interested in using more rapeseed uh, meal and rapeseed byproducts. And Yes, there are high levels of uh, glucosinolates, for example, in many uh, racy products. Well, glucosinolates is a family of chemical components, right? And these chemosensing techniques can help us to analyze a lot of these uh, components that are supposed to be glucosinolates and differentiate different type of, of them within the feed ingredients. Another way that we've been using or plan to use these chemometric uh, uh, assays. Recently, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Jerry Shurson, for example, and I, we put a grant to uh, study uh, mask mycotoxins. So the, the, the mycotoxins that we know, yes, but those mycotoxins can be transformed into metabolites, which in some cases could be more toxic or sometimes less toxic, and analyzing those other uh, mycotoxin byproducts or mask mycotoxins, it is important for us to understand the response of the animal to the mycotoxin. We did an experiment using also distillers grains, and it had um, some uh, vomitoxin, DON, but the levels were not high or, or higher than was reported in other papers. So we thought, well, the animals will do well. Well, we start feeding the animals and the animals are not eating the, the test diet. And right away we thought, well, there is something here, right? And so once we start to dig and using this systems biology tool, we find out, well, the animals had uh, vomitoxin, but they were other mycotoxins and they were other metabolites within the product that potentially explain why the animals, even though we analyzed DON and DON was okay, everything else was not okay. So I think there is uh, 
growing need for using these these tools uh, um, to understand how the animals respond to the diet. Um, within the systems biology tools, there is, for example, microbiota or microbiome. And um, um, I think Marcio uh, had interviewed one of my colleagues, uh, Andres Gomez, who could explain more eloquently um, um, the, the role of the microbiome on the animal performance. But again, these are responses to health or performance of the animals that we were not expecting based on just energy and protein. Uh, and they're still quite important. I think that um, maybe tying back the uh, fiber and, and the microbiota and, 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 and the systems biology tools, we do observe that not all fibers are equal. And when the animal consumes those fibers, sources of fiber, um, there is different changes in the microbiota. And even when people were using, uh, I think it's Dr. Dean Boyd, when he was using carbohydrate enzymes, he observed not a change in the diet energy. Maybe that's what he was pursuing at the beginning, but when he observed that he was marketing more pigs, I believe, he saw the value here is even greater than 50 kcals more into the diet. Maybe the, the ability for us to add the silanase in the diet and have an improvement in the number of pigs that we market or grade A pigs is greater than how many kcals I want to put in the diet. So I think the assistance biology tools, analyzing the microbiota, the metabolomics. Uh, I do a lot of work with a colleague, uh, Milena saki Salces is part of this group where she is uh, studying gut physiology. Uh, I quite important uh, for us to understand um, those instances where the animal respond to the diet in a way that we don't expect, but there is great value in understanding that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's exactly where we're headed the next five to 10 years is, is that type of research and, and getting down into those, into those weeds a little bit more to really understand the true impact. Um, we're starting to dabble ourselves with microbiome and uh, we're going a little bit different route, but it's, it's incredible when you start to dig into it, you know, the impact that, that changing the, the populations within the gut can have. Um, you know, so I think that type of work is, is really going to be interesting as we head down the nutrition path the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, Pedro, I see our time is really about up. Um, are there any key points that you would like to share with our audience today? Well, um, I think that, um, as, as I see, you know, uh, the, the, the points that we've talked, I think that is important for anybody to make sure that when feed prices are high, we all run to find out alternative or find out, but the message has been, well, put the work ahead of time because and create a system that allows you to respond to measure the response of the animals to the diet or the energy or the inputs, the amino acids that you're using and have that, in, have that in place so that when time comes, then you can make your accurate evaluation. And that system doesn't stay the same always, right? As you learn more things, you continue to evolve with the system. I think that's a very good point. Um, we, I think for a long time, just said, oh, distillers is our, is our backup option. And we got very comfortable with distillers, but we need to continue to push and challenge ourselves beyond that. Um, and even if we do use distillers, like we've talked about using enzymes or using other options to try to make the most out of what we're putting into that feed is going to be key in the next few years for sure. And, and the response is not, or the what we need to assess is not what is the best diet, but is what is the diet that allows me to have the most uh, pound per gain or the mm -hmm. most cost effective gain and that change over time. 
right. That's right. Always have multiple tools in your toolbox, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, some of the questions we like to to wrap up our podcast with are the the very common questions, but they're fun for our audience to just, you know, additionally get some additional resources and even some good learning books um, in the process. So the first question we like to ask is, you know, what's your favorite swine resource book? You know, what's that go-to book for you? Well, I must say, uh, but I know that many of the speakers have said the, the NRC, for example, um, for a swine nutritionist as the go-to book. Therefore, I want to offer, since I know that many people have said that, I, I want to offer, you know, alternative books that have helped me grow a, a, a along my career path. And there was a time where I was studying as a young veterinary, as a veterinary medicine student in Venezuela. I read The Diseases of Swine, for example. Uh, at that time was still the one edited by uh, Barbara Straw. And it was quite engaging because it helped me to learn a lot, not only on the diseases itself, but management and uh, feeding, and there were many other things. So it was quite a useful uh, um, a book to read. Um, there is pork production. I think Colin Whitmore is uh, uh, pork uh, uh, the science of, of pork production. I think it's the title or Colin Whitmore is a, it's a very nice book that I also read uh, uh, in my uh, as I was uh, growing into uh, or, or in my career. So it was was uh, oh, quite quite useful resource, and uh, I enjoy because that helped me to engage also with the study of swine production. Yes, I have both of those on my shelf, so those are, are very good books to have for sure. Um, how about some non non swine books? I know you're you're busy with your family, but are there opportunities where you you know pull a book off the shelf or or listen to an audio book and that you think our readers might enjoy? So a, a professional book that I think um, anybody should read is uh, good to uh, good to great. Um, I think is a a good resource for, for professional growth. Um, but also uh, growing up, I remember my father used to always tell me a message to Garcia is the way that he will uh, tell to me. For example, uh, the scenario we are working at the farm and we were maybe fixing a water pump and he will ask me, okay, go get me this wrench. And at a time, so I will come back and say, where, where is the wrench that? And at that time he will say, a message to Garcia. What he meant to say is, I'm busy, I'm trying to fix this water pump. I'm asking you for the tool. You go figure how to get me the tool because I don't have the time. And I think this, this little book is, is uh, uh, it's actually written in English um, by Albert Hobart. Um, the, the general message is, a person that is dependable is a person that can get an assignment and, and then figure out how to complete the task without taking a lot of time to, uh, uh, without needing a much direction, that the person can be self-sufficient to solve the problem. And I enjoy it and I um, recommend to anybody, I always think that you, the Problems in the pork industry are, are numerous and complex. And I think we all need to be uh, diligent in finding solutions. And the more we are working those solutions without needing to be asking always how to solve that is, is useful. That is not to say don't have resources, don't make connections with people, but at a time you, one needs to go and figure it out. And so that little book, uh, A Message to Garcia, has been something that grew, growing up, my father used to say. At the time when he will say it, I may get mad because, you know, why he doesn't say it, that he, he knows where the tool is, but why he, well, he's trying to teach me, just go figure. <laughs> yeah, but you know, water pumps always uh, break on Saturday evening and Maybe he was really mad and he said, you know, go figure because I need to get this done. <laughs> yes, yes. 
Yeah, I'll have to look at that book. That could be really good. I know um, problem solving and, and teaching people those softer skills can be sometimes a um, a piece that, that's hard to learn. And so, you know, having opportunities to read some books to help, I think could be really interesting. So I'll definitely have to check that one out. Um, the last question we have for you today is is really when you think about people within the industry or or you know at the university level that you've identified as being very successful and and success obviously looks different to everybody but when you think about people being successful in their profession what what's a key trait that that you think they possess? Well, go, going back to a message to Garcia, um, I I think one that that uh, can take a, get a task and then complete the task um, almost independently or, or can ask questions, but, but can be trust to carry on the task, I think. And that comes, I think, many times because people are passionate about what they're doing. And, and so I think being passionate is, is important. Um, that is not to say, I also believe that enjoyment in my profession or my career comes from also a little bit of hard work, that one cannot have the enjoyment if one does not put some effort into, into what we do. So what I want to say is that passion doesn't come uh, on its own. You need to, to pursue it too. Uh, but in, in this question, Laura, I also want to, because I've less listened to the postcard in the past and, and thought, you know, I, one thing that I want to um, uh, caution listeners uh, is when comparison are positive. So for example, I, I compare myself and I look at Laura Greiner, she has all this experience in applied soy nutrition and I don't well, I want to strive to learn from her. That's a positive comparison or a positive way to look at a mentor or a role model person. But honestly, at a times, one can make those comparisons in a negative way and either find jealousy or, or find despair because, oh, well, I'm not as successful as so-and-so or this person has had all these articles, is a famous soy nutritionist, I'm not, and that can make me feel um, uh, sad or, or, or despair. Well, that's the wrong way of doing uh, comparison or, or trying to compare yourself to other people. So I think I always caution people, uh, comparisons, there is a good way of, of finding comparisons of learning of other people. And there are maybe some that uh, are not as useful. Therefore, make sure that you take that away and always keep the positive way of making, learning from other people uh, by making the comparison. I think that's excellent advice, Pedro. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. Well, again, I do want to thank you for your time today, Pedro. And, and for our audience, this is Dr. Pedro Urala, who's an associate professor at the University of Minnesota. And uh, again, thank you and, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.